forgive the attire. I rushed out of my house this morning, hence the flip-flops. So utmost apologies. Um, anyhow, um, uh, that's more of a personal question. Now, I know Asad um, briefly mentioned the concept of ummah, um, from what I know. And so the reason why, for instance, I moved to Malaysia was to experience this sense of ummah, right? But unfortunately, I haven't felt it here, nor have I felt it in my country of origin, Syria. Now, I'm struggling to define the word of ummah, and I wanted to ask if any of the guests here, Dr. Tariq Ramadan, if you may um, expand on the concept of ummah as Assad saw it, and probably tune Dr. Mahathir from the politician side. I wanted to know, <laughs> no, no, I, I think it's good to have, since we're talking about critical thinking, to have also your understanding <clears throat> of the concept of ummah from a political aspect and from a more academic and scholarly aspect. So, Michael. Thank you. Assalamu alaikum. Thank you for coming to give us a speech. Uh, my question is, how do we, def basically, in terms of thinking, there's mythological thinking and there's logical thinking, like logos versus mythos. And um, half of the time, uh, tribalism or tribal thinking is based on mythology. And as we become more modern, we try to like, think critically and think logically, but how do we bridge between those two thoughts? How do we speak to um, people who only have that one way of thinking, which would be traditionalist, mytho mythology-based, and um, people who are modernist and logical thinking people? Is, is that clear? Sorry, my question? Yes. Yeah, because uh, I think the problem maybe with Malaysia is that tribalism or tribal thinking um, limits people from being brave and maybe questioning um, in order to understand themselves further. This uh, sense of like, this is my identity, therefore I cannot go against this, I cannot go against my culture, and I think that's sometimes a problem. Yeah. Thank you. How do you bridge that? Thank we'll, you. we'll take five. Yeah, I'm Aisha from Maldives and I'm currently going to graduate from my university, from my, uh, from my degree, and I'd like to go back and work in my country to, for the betterment of the country, of the society, and um, for the betterment of the Ummah as a whole. I would like to know what um, uh, Muhammad Asad uh, answer would be for a graduating student facing the work life and wanting to work in a way that will contribute to the Ummah towards, towards going towards modernism without uprooting ourselves from our traditions. If that's clear, thank you. One more. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I'll be just straight to the point uh, to our honorable guest, Name, please. Dr. Ramazan, and also Dr. Mahathir. Uh, yes, we are talking about Renaissance, and we have many dimensions to work on. It cannot be denied. But as Dr. Uh, Ramadan pointed out, that there is the issue of Western psyche. And the question then is, where do we go from here? What about our education system, our scholarship, should not some time and some resources be devoted in a scientific way to study the contemporary West and its psychological problems and our scholars coming out with approaches which will help the policy makers. We have very little in terms of study of the West in a scientific and objective sense to promote our agenda of the 21st century. I would like to hear from Dr. Mahathir and Dr. Ramazan. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, uh, thank you. There are lots of questions, and, uh, and I, I think that uh, um, what was said, the, the start, the, the first, it was not really a question, it was much more a statement about, you know, Fahm al-Qur'an, which is understanding the Qur'an. But, uh, you know, in, uh, um, I wrote something in, in Arabic, in English, and in French, which was a kind of an introduction to Qur'an. Uh, it was a, a, an introduction to one of the translations that we had in, in Western countries, in, in, in French, in fact, but also in English, uh, um, the Quran. And, and I was talking about this, which is understanding uh, the Quran, which is 
essential for us. But there are levels that has to be also that have to be understood. That the the, the Quran is for everyone to, to when it comes to al qiraa al ruhaniya which is the spiritual reading. It's for everyone. It's very simple to get attracted. Uh, with your heart and, and your, uh, not the, the emotional dimension only, but the spiritual attraction is there. So the first level is everyone. And there are levels after this. And then you have, uh, beyond the, the, the Quran beginning for everyone, there are the stories. And the stories, they are understood depending on, on your uh, uh, personal experiences and past and, and present. You know, a story, Qisas al-Qur'an are something which is, they are for all of us the same and for all of us different, because we are all different. What we extract from Musa's story, alayhi salam, and the stories are like mirrors. You put in them what you have in yourself. And this is why it's always, to, and, and, and even you can put in them yesterday what you are not going to put in them today. It depends on your personal state of, uh, of heart. So this is, and then al-ahkam, and then al-ahkam, it's deep knowledge, it's fahm. And this is why uh, you have anzala al-Qur'an, which is to bestow the Qur'an as it is, but also al-Rahman allam al-Qur'an. He taught the Qur'an, which has to do with knowledge, it has to do with understanding. And on that, every one of us should do his or her best to get the three levels. The first one is, is natural, the second one is really to go deep in your spiritual understanding, and the third one is then I need to have the basic uh, uh, knowledge of the rules, and then to extract rules, this is in mujtahid, it's not for, uh, we are not all expected to be ulama. This is something which is specialized world. You know, don't say, don't democratize the third level, and oh, anyone can just read the Quran, extract from the Quran, it's very dangerous. This kind of democratization of the knowledge of the al-ahkam is something that we have to be very cautious, because anyone can take the Quran, you take one verse and you uh, uh, interpret the Quran literally, you know, kill them wherever you find and say, oh, it's written, I can go and kill. And I say, this is very good democratization of your uh, understanding of the, you know, so you have people who are very naive on this. It has to do with knowledge we have to contextualize. So this is something which is important. A central discussion between what we, 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 we you know, what you said is the very meaning of an ummah. And you say you went here and you wanted to, to, to get this sense of the, the ummah. Uh, we have to stop romanticize the notion of ummah by saying, oh, you know, there is something which is deep. It's there without being verbal in the way you are dealing with your brothers and sisters wherever you go. And this is true. You cannot deny the fact that as a Muslim, you go to Muslim majority countries, you go to Muslim families, there is something which is brotherhood. There is something which is deep if you, you are experiencing it. Now we have to be very cautious to, by defining Ummah in a way which is quite clear, and this is the problem that I have with some of our brothers and sisters uh, in the way they are romanticizing al Ummah and sometimes closing the world of the Ummah. And this is why, as it was said, the Muhammad Asad worldview is quite important, but also our own definition of Ummah. Uh, 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 Ibrahim alayhi salam was an Ummah per se, is it in the Quran? He is described as a ummah. It's, it's a whole system. There is connection of all the dimension of you, who you are, the heart, the mind, the, the body, and everything. It's, it's, but what is the central axis? Is la ilaha illallah as the binding reference? And the second is principles. So I would define the ummah as the spiritual community, a religious community based on principles, not on blood, not on nationalities, because be very careful. There is no racism in Islam. There is racism among Muslims. It's not easy to be a black Muslim whereas Arab Muslims. It's not easy. There is a kind of racism that we have. So we come back to be careful. It's a spiritual community, but what is binding us is Allah. It's a spiritual communion. But there are rules, and these rules are our principles. At the end of the day, whatever is your commitment to Ummah, you belong to your principles. This is why the Prophet said to the Muslims, help your brother when he is right or wrong. And for the companion, it was strange. How could I help the brother when he is wrong? Prevent him from doing wrong. This is the way you are his brother. 
So it's a commitment to, you are my brother, we are sharing the same principle, but if you are right, I am with you. If you are wrong, I will stand up. This is the spiritual. So it's not my community, right or wrong. It's my community in the name of right. My community resisting wrong. Al-Amr bil ma'roof wa nahayan al-munkar. So this is the sense of the ummah that we need. We need to come, and you understand the point here, is a spiritual union with your heart and a critical thinking with your mind, always. Assessing the commitment to your brothers and sisters to the principles. I will never be your brother if in the name of our brotherhood you're asking me to support your injustice. This is why in Surah Al-Hujurat you have, وَإِن طَائِفَتَانِ مِنَ الْمُؤْمِنِينَ اقْتَتَلُوا فَأَصْلِحُوا بَيْنَهُمَا فَإِن بَغَتْ إِحْدَهُمَا عَلَى الْأُخْرَى فَقَاتِلُوا الَّتِي تَبْغِي If you have two groups of Muslims, they are fighting against each other, try to make peace between them. But if there is one group who is transgressing, face the transgressor in the name of your principle. This is the way you deal with the Ummah. So this is why it's really important when we travel around the world to experience this spiritual, you know, First dimension, which is so important. And then you add to this the critical thinking of our consistency to our principles. I am with the Ummah in that, di that, that dimension. And I would say here that when uh, uh, it's quite important in all what we were saying about Muhammad Asad, this is what, somewhere, but it's the, the very essence of Islam. In fact, he is recalling us and, and our scholars of this principle. But now, because we are on the defensive, we play the victims and we are united against. You know the sense of the Ummah that we have now? Against the domination of the West, against them. No, I'm not against anyone. I am for principles. I want the Muslims to unite, to unite for something, what we contribute, our principles. And sometimes you look at the Muslim majority countries, you know what, I'm against you, because you are betraying the very essence of Islam. And I am in the West and I have some principles that are more respected in the West than in Muslim majority countries. This is why I cannot enter six Muslim majority countries. <laughs> no, but uh, we have to be serious and consistent. Why is it that I can speak freely in some of the Western countries where I come to, in some Muslim majority countries? I can't talk. I can't even enter. Why is it? So my sense of community is to support them, right or wrong, and to look at the non-Muslims say, because you are non-Muslims, you are wrong. No, your principles are like mine. You are part of the principles that you are, you are promoting are me. So this is why my Sharia lies when it's right. So you, I, I took time for this because it's so central. It's the mindset. Because if you want to go beyond the, the, the victim mentality, don't transform the Ummah as a unity against the other, but a spiritual communion in the name of principles. And it changed everything. It changed everything. Wherever you are, you take the good. Wisdom is the last property, the last property of the Muslim, and he has the ownership of it, wherever he or she finds it. It changed everything, because you deal with principles. I belong to my principles. I don't belong to my blood. And I don't belong to a community asking me to betray my religion because we are the same religion. I, I won't buy this. And I think that this is the betraying, the betrayal of Islam on this. And, and, and I'm sorry I took too much time. We'll stop here. There are other questions. But I, I wanted to, uh, to respond to the last question. But I would say that maybe it's you, Professor Hassan, that who has to talk about, no, about education and, and, and uh, what was said about, you know, uh, universities and, and what we are teaching. It's quite interesting. <laughs>